Good morning, everyone. Thanks uh, so much for accommodating us as we uh, moved our, our weekly live chat an hour earlier. We didn't want to go up against uh, the inauguration for those who may be interested in, in watching that. Uh, I've had the uh, privilege of, of living uh, abroad for about five years, and I've lived in countries where um, it's either been a dictatorship or there has been no peaceful transition uh, of power. And so while we've uh, we've had our own challenges here uh, in this country, um, it's uh, it's quite an accomplishment uh, when you're able to peacefully transit from uh, from one president to the next, and uh, and it's an accomplishment uh, that we take note of today. And whatever our political views are, I think there's a there's much to be to be grateful for. Um, it, on campus, things are moving at a furious pace as we. Uh, we prepare for students to return on February 3rd. February 3rd is actually the first day of classes. It's a Wednesday, but many students um, will be phased in uh, moving back to campus on and off campus. Some are already coming. They'll be scheduled for everyone will receive a surveillance test, um, that uh, a rapid saliva test uh, when they come back to campus. If they don't pass that test, then they'll go for further testing and, and and uh, isolation or quarantining uh, before we start the semester. So we're gonna get started in a very safe way. And uh, a lot of work is going in to prepare for how we're gonna be able to accommodate students and all of the challenges this uh, next semester. But today you're in for a, a real treat. Uh, you're going to meet uh, and, and we're gonna have a chance to talk with uh, Professor Megan Sullivan, who really over the last 10 years, she's been at Notre Dame for about a decade now, maybe even especially over the last five years, um, she has become uh, mo one of the most recognized faces on campus and one of the most uh, beloved members uh, of the on-campus community here at Notre Dame. So it's with great pride that we get to introduce her to many new people uh, via this uh, live chat today. Um, Megan uh, Sullivan is the um, Wilsey uh, Family College Professor of philosophy at Notre Dame. She is the director of the Notre Dame Institute for Advanced Study, which you'll be hearing a little bit more about. And she pioneered and teaches uh, a course called God and the Good Life. In fact, um, you know, over a third of our first year students take that course in multiple sections uh, every year. And it's become more than a course it's become a cultural phenomenon on campus, and you're going to hear more about that course and uh, and and the Institute for Advanced Study, and uh, and more about uh, this wonderful leader uh, at Notre Dame, uh, who is Megan Sullivan. So, Megan, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, let's start with a, a question. It's it's cold out. There's snow on the ground. The last couple of days have been pretty bitter. My understanding is that you share this in common with my Brazilian wife, is that you hate the cold. And uh, so tell tell us a little bit, how are you faring in this kind of weather this time of year? You Typical might be Zoom mistake. Uh, Carmen and I have actually empathized about this, I think, because I see her sometimes when I'm walking from my house to campus. Uh, when it gets this cold in South Bend, I'm from Greensboro, North Carolina, I get into like panic mode, like some part of my, uh, my, my very being thinks, oh my gosh, I'm going to freeze to death. <laughs> uh, and it is tricky. I've learned to buy like really thick winter coats and really good boots. I've learned to uh, find people like Carmen to just complain with, with constantly and to remember that the sun will eventually come back. Um, but yeah, no, this is, this is definitely a tricky time of year. I think we got three inches last night. Yeah. It was a complete lake effect uh, uh, thing. And, and please talk with Carmen more about this because, you know, I'm a guy who grew up in Buffalo. And if you, if you grow up in Buffalo, you can move anywhere and be happy. And Carmen grew up in the Trop of Cap, Capricorn. So I'm not as sympathetic a listener to, yeah. her, to her complaints as you would be. So I hope you guys foster that dialogue throughout these winter months for years to come. But let me ask you about growing up in Greensboro, North Carolina. Tell us a little bit about the family dynamic and not only how did you become a philosopher and when did you know that 
you were different, thinking really deep esoteric thoughts. And, and also, I'd, I'd like to hear a little bit more about um, how faith and, and, and your you know, commitment to your religiosity, um, Catholicism, how that came about as well. Yeah, Lou, I think if if y'all had known me in high school, I think you'd be really surprised that I ended up uh, both Catholic and a philosopher, because uh, that definitely was not what I, uh, the direction I looked like I was pointed in when I was 16, 17 years old. Um, I grew up in a not very academic family. My mom is an office manager in a dental office, and my dad has worked a bunch of different kinds of sales jobs. We're very much like middle class North Carolina family um, and not particularly religious. It's weird. A lot of my students have never met a philosopher before they take God in the good life. I actually knew a philosophy professor when I was in high school. My, I went to a big public high school. My best friend in high school, Jessica, her dad was a professor at UNC Greensboro in the philosophy department. And so I knew what a philosopher was, but we all thought that his job was just like totally abstract, had nothing to do with the real world, wasn't a real job. And so in high school, I had a very negative view of what philosophy professors were, which is completely unfair to Gary. I, I definitely owe him like an apology letter or something. <laughs> we were horrible. I went to the University of Virginia on a scholarship and I thought I wanted to be a lawyer. I was actually, I, I, I'd done competitive debate all in high school and I loved it. It seemed like a really natural prof professional progression for me. Um, I was a really good student and so ended up at UVA and like every freshman, I, I couldn't get all the pre-law classes I wanted. So my advisor was like, you look like the kind of person that would like an ethics class and you like debate. I'm gonna put you in this huge philosophy class called Issues of Life and Death. Um, and I loved it. I, I remember like the second week of school, just being completely entranced. The professor was this woman, Cora Diamond. She's a, she's a very famous ethicist at UVA. And the thing I loved about the class is she would come up twice a week and she would just pose a question to us as a group um, that was directly related at, uh, at our thinking about a really big topic. So we would read David Hume and she would come into class and rather than asking us a bunch of trivia facts about the Scottish Enlightenment, she'd say, all right, what do you think? Is it ever morally permissible to commit suicide? That's Hume's question. It's your question. You know what he thinks. How are you gonna reason through this? And it wasn't okay to just have an opinion. You had to have reasons. You had to have really thought through mm -hmm. it. And then you got to write essays about it. I just thought this was like, I had no idea human beings could do this mm -hmm. before I took Cora Diamond's class. So I took it and I was like, this is so much fun and seems so important. And we, we gradually went through all of these major ethical questions. I was like, I wanna keep doing this as kind of my hobby. Mm -hmm. So I started taking more philosophy classes. My, my students here always have their hobby major or minor and then their serious major or minor. Mm -hmm. um, and what happened for me is like the hobby by the time I was a second year in college had really just taken over all like, you know, I, I loved it. I couldn't get enough of it. Um, and that was around the same time that I was being called to religious faith. Um, so I think Probably in retrospect, you know, it shouldn't be a surprise that I'm this like 18, 19 year old that's thinking about philosophy constantly and trying to chart out her adult life. But my first year in college, um, I really had these big questions about what am I aiming for in life and am I living up to the kinds of the kind of person that I think I should be and, re and realizing that I wasn't mm -hmm. and also realizing that there were things that were missing from my life, but I didn't quite know what they were. And uh, on the anniversary of September 11th, I started college when the 9-11 attacks happened. On the first anniversary of 9-11, there was a, a Dominican run parish right near my dorm uh, on the UVA campus. And I'd been curious about it for a long time. I'd been walking by and like thinking, I wonder what like happens at church. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the first anniversary, I thought, I'm going to go check it out. I bet they're going to say something meaningful about this, like, very, very challenging day. And I'd been thinking a lot about it um, and wanted to be with people who were thinking about it. Went to Mass. It was not a Mass about 9-11. It was a very, like, ordinary weekday <laughs> Mass. But that was the first time I'd really been around people who were seriously in prayer. And obviously, it was around, like, the Eucharist. And uh, it was transformative for me And my second year of college. I had all this philosophy in my mind, but also had this like really personal yearning that kind of was met with uh, with the folks at St. Thomas Aquinas and uh, the priests there like really welcomed me and talked with me in my third year of college, it, it came into the church. Um, so that's maybe a longer answer to the story than yeah. you wanted, but uh, but it was it, the, those years between 17 and 20 
were really pivotal for my life. And it's something I think about all the time when we're, um, we're teaching kids that age here at, at Notre Dame now is God, like so many really important decisions and turning points happened in that period. And that's definitely what happened for me. You know, there, there's something deeply moving in, in, uh, in, in how cyclical this has become that you have this epiphany both the calling to philosophy and, and to kind of a religious awakening of sorts your first year at UVA. And now you've come and pioneered this, this course, God and the Good Life, which allows our students to, to, to engage in rigorous discernment about calling, what's important to them. I got to ask you before we go further, and I got a lot of questions here, you know, it, it looks, it's got to be catching some of our viewers, corrupt the youth. <laughs> the stock behind you. What does that mean? And uh, is that something we should be concerned about? You should always be concerned about philosophers talking to your children first. <laughs> off. Um, uh, so uh, Corrupt the Youth, it comes from uh, Plato's Apologies. So um, if you remember your ancient Greek history, Lou, which I'm sure you learned at Notre Dame, I was a PLS major, so I, I took a lot of those. <laughs> okay, books. you better remember this. You've read all these books. Yep. Um, philosophy as we know it in the West started with Socrates 2,400 years ago. Socrates is in Athens. Athens is at the peak of civilization. They're inventing mathematics. They're inventing naval warfare. Uh, they're inventing plays. And they're inventing philosophy. And what did that mean? It meant that they're learning to ask these really big questions about like, what is the nature of justice? What would it be for us to have a truly great government? What does it mean to have a goal for your life that's a legitimately great goal? And Socrates got famous for having all of these questions and being completely unafraid of asking them. Mm -hmm. And uh, that sounds great. Like, you know, to, of course, we should have more people like that. No, people like that are, are really annoying. And Socrates in Athens would go to like the most famous judge and question them like do you really understand what justice is is this just is this other thing just he was like the most annoying person at your cocktail party and he would ne if your answers sounded shallow or they didn't have really good reasons behind them he'd just keep pushing you and pushing you and pushing you and for a while people thought this was really interesting i mean athens prided itself on its intellectual culture but then he started teaching the teenagers how to do it <laughs> um and had a question authority and had a question whether Athens really was the greatest civilization on earth or whether Athens should try to be better. And that's what ultimately got him in big trouble. And so Plato's apology is the report of Socrates being put on trial when Athens finally got sick of all of his questions and were, were begging him to stop because he was kind of destabilizing their democracy. Right. And one of the very famous charges against Socrates was that he was corrupting the youth by teaching them to question everything in these ways. Yeah. So, of course, Socrates, as you know, spoiler alert, uh, he lost his his battle with Athens and they um, they executed him and corrupt the youth has become kind of a rallying cry for philosophers who are trying to emulate the best parts of his teaching ever since. And we when we were sharing this with our students, our God in the Good Life students a couple of years ago, and we have this huge army of students that work with us on the course. Of course, they love this. They love like the edgy dimension of it. So they made it kind of the unofficial and now probably quasi official motto of the course. So, like they students sign off emails with Corrupt the Youth or CTY and yeah. it's on like t-shirts and hoodies on campus right now. And in uh, April, when we were all remote and we were like getting, we were just like pining to come back to campus and to have our normal class again and to do things together we uh, commissioned the big banner that you see behind me. Yeah. Um, it's kind of like we, we ordered the banner and we had it and we'd show it on Zoom and we'd be like, you know, we're gonna bring out this banner when we're all back together. And when we did come back, now we, we brought it to every lecture in the fall and we have it at all of our like big outside events. So I love, that's the story I love, of Corrupt Yeah, I absolutely love the concept, Megan. Uh, the, the problem is, is that two of our five kids have taken your course, absolutely loved it. One of them is a, a facilitator, as you know, yeah. uh, of small group discussions, but uh, I'm not sure either one of them needed any further corruption. Um, so from a parent standpoint, it's been, uh, it, it, you've added to our challenges, but in, in a very healthy way. So you, at UVA, you graduate with distinction and you're awarded a Rhodes Scholarship. You're off to Oxford to study philosophy now. Before returning to do your PhD in philosophy at Rutgers, and, and how do we get you to Notre Dame? First of all, 
What did you do to get a Rhodes Scholar? I mean, that, that Rhodes Scholarship, that's very difficult. What, what questions did you articulate that really um, captured their fancy? And then ultimately, what brought you to Notre Dame? The Rhodes story is really funny because I um, so was really involved with student government at UVA. I was the chairwoman of the honor committee, which is like being, you know, it's a very big student government job at UVA. It's a really strong honor system. And basically UVA always uh, tries to nominate its top student leaders for the Rhodes competition. Like Notre Dame does the same thing. I advise a lot of our students here and we always try to push the student leaders into that. But when I came across their desk, UVA really did not know what to do with me because normally these student leaders are like pre-law or pre-medicine or pre-professional. And I, at that point, wanted to be a philosopher and not just a philosopher, but like a really abstract philosophy. Like I was interested in modal logic. That was my topic. Mm -hmm. And so I remember talking to my professors when I was getting nominated for the Rhodes and my professors there would be like, well, you know, we would write you a nomination for the Nobel Peace Prize. We think you're great. Like, we think you're wonderful, <laughs> but you're not, you know, Rhodes Scholars are people who are going to run for president or become <laughs> secretary of the Department of Transportation. <laughs> they're not, they're not people who are obsessed with the logic of vagueness. So, we're, you know, we don't think we're really uncertain you're going to be a good candidate for this, but we think so highly of you that, of course, we're going to throw you in for the interviews. And so I, I, you know, I didn't think I was competitive either. I thought I was just going to go straight to a philosophy PhD. Well, I got an interview, and this is back when you had to do multiple rounds of interviews for the roads. You had to interview in your state, and then you had to go to Washington, D.C. for the big one. And they all happened within a couple of days of each other. I went to the state interview and realized uh, I had a huge advantage in that all of the people I were up against, they were all pre-professional, wanted to be law or business or doctors, and they were all really good, but they were all competing against each other. Mm -hmm. And the panelists, when they got to me, I was like a breath of fresh air. I mean, I was just the weirdest person. I'd, writ I'd writ written this like long essay about the logic of vagueness, and I was clearly very passionate about it, and also like, but also kind of a student leader. And so I think that gave me a huge advantage when I was in those really tough interviews is that I was really smart, but I also got to play on my own playing field because they had to ask me philosophy questions and none of the I knew more about philosophy than anybody on any of those panels. Yeah. So then I got it. And I was, of course, like the weirdest person in the Rhodes cohort that year, <laughs> by like a huge factor. <laughs> um, but uh, but it turned out to be wonderful. I and mean, Oxford's an absolutely amazing place to study philosophy. And I made some just tremendous friends when I was out there. Um, so, uh, so it was, a, it was a wonderful experience. And then, uh, and then of course I had to leave and go actually do my real philosophy PhD. So I came back to, to Rutgers and then, uh, Notre Dame was my first job out of grad school. And that was also, uh, I'm not sure the story with some of my colleagues here. This is the, that's the kind of story that makes other philosophers hate me mm -hmm. because it's, it's, uh, it's a tight job market for really top jobs in philosophy. Um, there are only a few of them every year. Mm -hmm. And Notre Dame is a top job in philosophy. We're one of the best philosophy departments in the world. Mm -hmm. And for the kind of philosophy that I do, we're usually in the top one or two. So this mm -hmm. is like a, a really amazing job. And Notre Dame wasn't hiring the year that I went on the job market. Um, so I had come out here for a conference hosted by the Center for Philosophy of Religion my mm -hmm. last year of grad school. It was the first academic conference I'd ever been to. And uh, it was all about faith and combining faith with really rigorous philosophy. And I loved it. I was out here for a week. I still have pictures of that week. I'd never been to our campus. Uh, it was just, it was this beautiful May week. We were talking about these ideas that I was totally obsessed with, but are not really big in the New York philosophy departments. Mm -hmm. I made a bunch of friends. And I remember thinking in the day before we went to the airport to go home, I was sitting out in God Quad and just thinking like, gosh, these people are so lucky. Like, it's just so amazing that some people get jobs like this. Um, and, uh, you know, it's great that I got to see it. I'll probably go back and I'll apply for like 100 philosophy jobs and maybe end up leaving the field and going into business or something. That was kind of where I was at that point. Mm -hmm. um, unbeknownst to me, I'd, I'd really made a connection with a bunch of the faculty when I was here for that conference and talking with them about research and projects and faith. And uh, some people from the department went to the provost's office at the time and asked, you know, could we uh, potentially consider this as a this woman as a job candidate? We don't have to hire her, but maybe bring her out for like an interview and just check it out. And so uh, Notre Dame agreed. And I was interviewing for other jobs at that time. I got this email out of the blue 
from the department chair saying like, would you like to come to out to South Bend and give a job talk to our department? I mean, stuff like this never happens. And it, the job talk is a big deal for philosophers. It's this two hour presentation where people basically just try to like rip your research apart. Yeah. And they're like, come, you know, you want to come out next month and show us what you're made of. And maybe we'll think about hiring you. <laughs> Right. And I like and, and and I did it and uh, I had a wonderful trip when I was out here for the job interview. It was the same thing of like, gosh, these people are so lucky. This is amazing. And got the got the job and it's been kind of like destiny ever since. Um, so but it's one of these stories like that's usually not how it works. <laughs> right. Well, it's an amazing story. And, and it's it's one that that, you know, you've been here now for for 10 years. And I know that there's been other top universities in the country. Uh, that have tried to recruit you away, and you've stayed. Um, so there's something that you found kind of your fit here, and certainly you've made a huge impact, which certainly trans you know definitely transcends the campus at Notre Dame. Um, let me ask you, just as a novice, kind of looking at at you, how do you philosophize? I mean, I, I just have this image that if I were a philosopher, and we've got five kids, and I'm I, I sit back in my Barca lounger and Carmen says, I need some help with the dishes or whatever. And I, I'll say to her, I can't right now, honey, because I'm laying back with my eyes closed in the Barca lounger. I'm thinking deep thoughts. Um, I would have a very short lived, you know, marriage. How do you, how do you philosophize? Do you do it in a solitary room? Do you do it all the time? Do you do it like a, uh, like, uh, a Socrates, you know, walking the market square. Give us a little background. I'm sure it's different from for each philosopher, but how does it work for you? I think this is a great question. I get this one from my mom all the time too. <laughs> I think she's still skeptical that this is a job. <laughs> um, so a big part of uh, doing research in philosophy is writing books and articles that contribute to philosophical debates. Um, philosophical debates, you know what they are already, like what's the best form of government? What is it to like truly love another person? How do we know that God exists? What's the nature of faith? These questions have been pretty constant actually for 2,400 years and they're still the kinds of questions that professional philosophers in 2021 work on the way people were working on them in Athens in 400 BC. Yeah. Um, the work that we produce again they tend to be research articles and books some of them are impossible for a lay person to read so if i'm working on a logic paper it's like solving a big math problem and you're you're uh you're working on the different pieces of it and you think you got a solution and you share it with your friends and they tell they find a problem and you fix it mm -hmm. uh but other big projects I'm, I'm just starting my third book right now so i wrote a book on philosophy of time a couple of years ago just finished a big book on god and the good life with a colleague here now I'm writing my third research book, which is on the role that love plays in moral philosophy. What does that look like on a day to day? Well, yesterday I was working on the first chapter and there's a philosopher study arguments. There's this form of argument like I felt the need to stop and help Lou, a stranger, when I saw him injured on the roadside because I thought Lou could be my brother. Um, I felt, you know, there are a bunch of examples of giving this kind of empathetic argument for why you help another person. As a philosopher, I find examples of people moved by that kind of argument. We see it in the parable of the Good Samaritan. So I think a little bit about how have people historically thought about these kinds of arguments and what's really going on when we give ourselves that argument for helping or caring for another person. So you find a bunch of examples of the arguments. You think about the, in, in a historical way, about the depth of what's going on when we think that way. And then philosophers ask this question, is it logical? Like, is this reasonable? Is it ethical? And you try to write, build up the case for why it is. I mean, that's part of my, uh, it's a bit like a lawyer. Like I want to defend Jesus's argument in the parable of the Good Samaritan and show how it's still relevant to how people are making moral decisions today. Show me, show the work, um, show me all of the reasons why this is right. Or if it's not, then maybe we should change our mind and stop reasoning this way. Mm -hmm. So that part involves like sitting at your computer trying to build up your case and make it as strong as possible. And then you show it to your friends in other philosophy departments, either by giving a lecture or by emailing and begging them to read it. And then mm -hmm. they find all the problems with your reasoning. And then you go back and try to make it stronger. So there's a lot of like writing and critique. Uh, and then hopefully you get the case really good and you're ready to publish it and, it and it moves people. It helps people see a problem in a much deeper and more useful way. Yeah. Terrific. And, and, and at a Catholic university, 
I'm, I'm guessing that um, philosophy takes on a, a much more significant role than at most secular universities, right? Uh, it's uh, it's it, it's it's core to the mission of the university together with theology. So is in the fact that we have every student has to, regardless of major, take a philosophy course um, at the university. It, is our department larger? Is is it does it is it more pervasive than you would find at other universities? Our department's pretty big. I think we're probably the second biggest department in North America. I think Toronto's got a bigger one, um, just for various institutional reasons. But even besides, like just the scope of philosophy here, which is you know awesome. Uh, I think one thing that's pretty different, I studied philosophy at, um, at public universities. It was at UVA. Oxford's technically a public university in its own weird way, and Rutgers. Um, and in, uh, in most of most academic philosophy departments, there's this sense, I think, that you're, um, you're studying this tradition of philosophy, but there's not very much emphasis on this idea that philosophy could change you as a person. In fact, you don't usually talk that way. It seems like a little bit weird to talk that way. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I loved about Notre Dame and my first time being just totally immersed in a Catholic context is Catholic universities don't have that bias at all. Mm -hmm. um, it's very much the reason we teach philosophy is because we have souls that are in need of the truth. And if we don't work on your logical capacities and we don't teach you about how other people have thought about these really big ethical and existential questions, then we're depriving you of something that's like, you know, water and air and family and shelter, just like a core essential human good. And it, it took me a couple of years at Notre Dame in the period before we started God in the Good Life to, to really realize, oh, this is incredibly powerful. Um, this kind of optimism that, you know, we can still be changed by ethics, like we can still be changed by theology, it can change our lives, it can change our society. Um, that feeling of philosophy has this really deep personal transformative power. Um, that's very much a feature of a, of a serious Catholic university. That's not the way like a, a secular research department would think about it. Um, so again, that's maybe kind of a, a like longer answer to your question, but I think that's something that's really special about Notre Dame is it's like, we believe kind of like the ancients did, like folks like Plato and Aristotle, that philosophy can corrupt you. <laughs> like it still has the power to change you um, rather than just being a, a kind of abstract or, or flat subject that you study from arm's length. I, I have, you know, I, I want to talk about the Institute for Advanced Study, um, for which you recently have uh, assumed um, a very important leadership role, which goes well beyond philosophy and, and transcends every department at the university. But I have one final question I want to ask before that. I'm fascinated by the, the, the conversation here, and I could go on and on. But tell us a little bit about what makes God and the Good Life, the course, distinct. What What are some of the questions? Or, or maybe you can even give us a vignette of what you do with the students that makes that course jump off the page for them and, and stirs kind of deep reflection within them. Sure. Um, so I think they're, they're kind of like three pieces to the God and the Good Life recipe, though it's also just this culture, as your, as your kids could tell you. This is also a weird cultural dimension to it. The three big things, I think, are first, the learning goal. So our goal is not necessarily for students to be able to pass a really long multiple choice exam about the history of philosophy at the end of it. That used, that's our old goal. Mm -hmm. But uh, we care that they learn the history of philosophy really well and we read all the greats in the class. But our, our ride or die goal at the end of the course is in 14 weeks, a freshman at Notre Dame should be able to write an authentic and really well-reasoned essay answering four big questions about their vision of the good life. What role is faith gonna play in your life going forward? How do you decide what you're gonna believe? What do you think are your deepest moral obligations and how are you gonna handle the fact that people might disagree with you about this? And then obviously the, the money question is like, what we, ha we have 80, 90 years on planet earth. What, uh, what activities can we take up and decisions can we make now to make sure that that life is meaningful. And what is that, what are we aiming at? Like, what's the target that we're shooting at with this life? Mm -hmm. And those are questions that are definitely on the minds of 18 and 19 year olds. 
And they're not questions you just have to guess at. That's the point of studying philosophy is they're ones that people have given quite a bit of thought to and, can, yeah. and thought that can possibly help you. So the first thing is like that big goal. We want you to leave the class with your plan uh, and then you're going to change it. One of the best parts is watching those freshmen then become seniors and they go back and look at that essay and be like, I was clueless. <laughs> I had no idea what I was doing. We yeah. want them, but we want them to start thinking about it all the time. Yeah. The second big component of the class is uh, it's public facing. So you're, these aren't topics just for really smart people. They're not topics just for studying at your Catholic college, but we put all of our material up on the webpage and we try to invite as many people as possible into the conversation with us. Um, so we have this really extensive God in the Good Life webpage and we share a lot of our materials with people who are interested in philosophy. And then the third part um, is that we don't, professors are some of the experts on this. Like I explained to my students who Plato was, but we spend a lot of time at the beginning of class teaching students how to ask really strong questions to each other. Like how do you ask an open truth seeking question about a moral problem that you wanna know more about to another person and listen to the answer. Mm -hmm. um, so we spend a lot of time working with Notre Dame students to basically like deputize them and make them into philosophers and then release them out onto campus to, to do what Socrates was doing, but to each other. So those are, those are kind of, that's, if we had to distill like the special sauce, I think those are the three big parts of it. Um, and it has been incredibly powerful. And, and what the appetite, if you would, just for a second with, for our viewers, what are some of the questions you actually, you know, ask our students to think about I've, I've heard like the pain pill question or, you know, who's had a more impactful life in this world, uh, Mother Teresa or Beyonce. Can you give yeah. us a few examples of these very provocative questions that they have to think about and then defend their answers with? Yeah, we try to pick a question right from the news to start off every class. So in fact, we won't put something on the God and the Good Life syllabus unless we can find an article from the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times or the Atlantic that shows that philosophical problem in the wild. We're doing that right now as we get ready for the spring semester. Uh, you got it. One question we put is like, who's a better person or whose life would you most like to have, Beyonce or Mother Teresa? That's when we get in like, what are you aiming at? Yeah. Um, one that was really potent for us this past fall is we did a case study on Airbnb. Um, so Airbnb, their CEO is this guy, Brian Chesky, and their motto is, is their, their company's mission is let's make everyone feel a sense of belonging everywhere. And we're, we're a family. Our company is a family that takes care of people as a family would. They got into real trouble during the pandemic because uh, Airbnb had to shut down. A lot of their bookings closed out when, um, when the pandemic hit and they had to lay off a bunch of their employees. So we write a story about making this decision about layoffs when you've uh, told people you have this really special obligation to care for them as family members. And it's a, that's a hard business question, how you handle a puzzle like that. We studied it and then we raised this philosophical question to our students like, where, what role does work play in the good life? And if you're somebody's manager, what res moral responsibilities does that entail for you? And if yeah. you're an employee, how should you balance your, your vision of work with your overwhelming vision of your goals to your family or your goals to your country? Um, so that was really powerful because that, you know, that had just happened. Airbnb was yeah. still trying to figure out their strategy. And so we ask our students, pretend like you're Brian Chesky. And you got this huge problem. Um, like, what are you going to say on the Zoom call to those employees that's going to show that you've got a, a moral core? Yeah. Um, so we always try to find cases like that and let the students wrestle with it. And, and we pick ones where there are no easy answers. That's not, that was a hard problem for Airbnb. And we want the students to also wrestle with the fact that you got to own the moral views that you bring to a problem like that. Terrific. I, I, you know, what a blessing. Uh, Again, you know, for my kids and for our Notre Dame students to be exposed to uh, to that rigorous level of meaningful discernment. So tell us about the, what is the Institute for Advanced Study? I know it's relatively new um, institute here on campus, uh, maybe over the last 10, 15 years. And um, why did you choose uh, to uh, to accept the leadership of that institute? And what do you hope to do with it? I think it's really exciting. Um, so one of the, another upshot, one, one thing that's great about Notre Dame is you can teach classes like God and the Good Life and you can really challenge students with these big questions and, and have the optimism that we can come up with, uh, with good answers. In our research, the exact same puzzle comes up. 
Like we know, as a philosopher, I know that we're facing major philosophical problems in the 21st century. Here are a couple, just like Athens was trying to figure out what form of government is gonna make us into the best kind of people. That's the same question we're facing in our country right now. We also face major questions about religion in the good life right now. We just came off of a year of celebrating our Catholic faith largely over Zoom. We did Easter over Zoom this year. Yeah. That's so strange. Yeah. What does this mean for like prayer and corporate worship when uh, technology is enabling us to do these new things, but they don't really fit with how we've thought about this 2,000-year-old uh, faith? Those are research questions. They're not just like, you know, dinner party questions, though they're great things to talk about over dinner right. sometimes, maybe not politics. But they're also questions that we can study and that like really smart people with really great ideas could help us come up with better answers. Mm -hmm. And the point of the Institute for Advanced Study is that doesn't just happen by accident. Notre Dame needs to go out and find people with really promising ideas on these really big ethical and meaning questions. And we need to bring them to campus and we need to get them focused and working together to try to produce books and articles and talks um, and suggestions that might really help us move the needle on these really big questions of ethics and faith and meaning that we're all facing that are a part of this century that we live in. So um, that was the, the, the ambition and vision behind the Institute. And we're, we launched our, our new project this year, which was like launching a really ambitious research institute in the middle of a global pandemic. I would not recommend, Lou, <laughs> but we have had a really amazing year. We, we picked this year, we picked as our uh, research focus, the nature of trust. So like we really wanna get a deeper understanding of what trust is, why it matters so much, and how we can be worthy of it as individuals mm -hmm. and as institutions that we're involved in building. Mm -hmm. So we have a really top social psychologist. She's gathering the data. Uh, she's doing this huge meta-analysis of why are, why are we starting to trust institutions and each other less and less? Like what, what are the variables that are pushing trust down in our country? And, and we're learning some alarming things. Younger people have way lower levels of trust than older folks in our country. So like, what does it mean when there are these generational differences? One thing we pay researchers to do is help us just understand the problems that we're facing. Mm -hmm. Sarah's helping us do that. We also have writers and artists and philosophers who are trying to think like, what are all of the different ways we might imagine life together looking different? And uh, are these good? Are these like worthy goals for people like us? And, and so, so you help to understand, you invite these fellows um, to the Institute from all over the world, right? They could be- yep universities, other universities, practitioners, you'll invite them to Notre Dame for a year, typically. How big is the cohort? We aim for about a dozen top researchers from literally the, the best people we can find on planet Earth. So we're really trying to put together like an NFL team. You know, we're trying mm -hmm. to get the best people in the best roles who are going to have the best ideas on the topic that we're convening on. Um, so this year, we've got a world famous science fiction author, a guy named Ted Chang. He wrote the, he wrote the short story that the movie Arrival is based on. He's, a, he's our like creative force in the group. Mm -hmm. um, we've got Peter Buttigieg, the former mayor of South Bend, who's quite involved um, in one branch of political life in the country right now. He's telling us like exactly how politicians are thinking about these questions. Mm -hmm. We've got a, a more conservative political theorist from Oxford who's, uh, who's talking about the views that are coming out of political theory at Oxford right now that are relevant to this trust question. We just try to assemble the most interesting and powerful group we can. And yeah, we bring them here to South Bend. This year, three quarters of them are here in various levels of in-person and some of them are on Zoom just because of the pandemic. Right. Normally, we try to bring them all physically here to Flanner Hall on the 11th floor, and we basically lock them in offices, Lou, and we give them coffee and computers, <laughs> and we meet um, uh, once a week as a research group, and then also throughout the week with Notre Dame students and Notre Dame PhD students, mm -hmm. and we try to get some great ideas to come out of Notre Dame on these really big questions, and we encourage them to publish and to, to uh, speak to the press. They teach classes to Notre Dame students. We did two classes this year on trust in the fall um, with our fellows. And we basically try to incubate really powerful ideas that we think could make a difference on these ethical questions that we should be studying. Mm -hmm. Next year, our theme is resilience. We're, we're just finishing up our, our draft for the researchers and the students for that. And the idea behind the resilience project is 
we learned a lot this past year about how to deal with rapid change and how to face adversity. Mm-hmm. How, as researchers, are we going to distill and study the big lessons from this year so that we're ready for the next big challenge? Um, right. And again, the thought is you need people working together in different disciplines. You need them to be really focused and really optimistic and to kind of absorb some of the spirit of Notre Dame mm-hmm. um, so, that, so that we can have those ideas that will affect both the research projects that are happening on our own campus, but also hopefully just make a difference in the wor- world. You know, the next big ethical idea mm-hmm. could very well come out of South Bend. So in, 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 addition, in addition to, you know, just serving the common good um, and really spreading the seed and not knowing where this research is going to go, but impacting people throughout the world, maybe teaching a, a couple of courses, bringing in these, you know, global scholars and researchers uh, that will be exposed to our students and faculty what is, what is the other impact on, on Notre Dame? Some of these people, do we all actually, do they fall in love with the place as you did with your visit, you know, 10 years ago, 11 years ago? And do we recruit them to join the faculty in some cases? Do they become the ambassadors for Notre Dame when they go back to their home places? What is the ultimate, you know, a bit selfishly asking um, impact on Notre Dame too? Yeah, sometimes when we're really lucky, we don't say this to the home departments when we're like negotiating these research contracts, but, um, you know, behind the scenes, we're also always secretly hoping we got this superstar from Harvard or Michigan or Oxford to come spend a year with us, and they really like it, and they realize that this is a really vibrant and fun intellectual culture, and then they they quit their home job and they just don't come back. Yeah. Uh, and that does happen. We do. This is a, um, one of the one of the many tools the university has for trying to recruit really top scholars who we think fit with our ambitions. Um, but even when that doesn't happen uh, and folks go back to their home department, we hope that they understand uh, the role that the Catholic intellectual tradition is playing in the big debate that they're a part of. I and mean, we hired them because they're a superstar, but sometimes they didn't have a lot of uh, understanding of the role that um, that the Catholic tradition is uh, playing in this debate, and by the time they leave here, they definitely understand that. Yeah. And then another thing we do is, um, you know, we're a university-wide interdisciplinary research institute. We're super collaborative, and a lot of times that our ideas for themes or who to bring to campus, it comes from our colleagues. Like we're trying to get this technology ethics center started. We'll host a couple really top tech ethics scholars to come to campus and work really closely with the tech ethics crew who are building up their center um, to, to help get those ideas moving really fast. This incubator idea matters a lot to us, this thought that we run this really intensive one-year running bold experiments program, and the very best things that we learn from the year at the Institute then go on to have much longer shelf life in departments on campus, um, in the PhD students that we train on campus, and in the faculty that collaborated with us to put together these projects. Mm -hmm. So it's very much like a a team sport around Notre Dame. And one of the things that's most fun for me in this job is, you know, until I came into NDIS, my world was really like philosophy and theology and Malloy Hall. Um, And now you just see all the cool things that are happening in the College of Science. Uh, and what our colleagues in English are doing and all the different ways that like these roads through Notre Dame cross within each other. Yeah. And we get to be right at the crossroads of that, um, having, you know, helping launch the really cool initial ideas. Yeah. Uh, so so th- that's one, I think that's probably our biggest impact on campus is like being a spot where lots of different ideas can bubble and germinate and then the very best ones go on to live on our campus, hopefully for a really long time. So let's say that one of our viewers is watching uh, this interview and says, wow, this, this uh, Megan Sullivan, she's a superstar, and I really love the idea of the Institute for Advanced Studies, and I want to make a, a major eight-figure gift uh, oh, to support her. Call what me. Would you do? What would <laughs> you do? Lou. Yeah. What would you do with that, and how would you, you know, build on the vision uh, of this uh, Institute for Advanced Study? Good. I think uh, a couple of things. First, finding, you know, we are doing a great job at the moment of recruiting really top people to be part of this project and this mission with us. But obviously funding these fellowships for the year, giving them the capacity, like having the capacity to host really big research conferences that have this really big public facing impact. That's all the kind of thing that we, we really need to build out resources for. 
Um, so that's step one. But two big things that we're trying to start doing, um, but have not been part of the Institute's mission in the past. One, you know, God in the Good Life is, a, is an amazing course and, and has really had a tremendous impact on our campus. And we work with about 120 other philosophy professors right now on versions of the class on other campuses. That's a really great philosophy intervention, but we, we know from this past year that we need all kinds of really innovative courses that are on mission, not just in philosophy, but everywhere. There, there are all kinds of professors that have this dream in their heart for how they wanna change a student's life with history, with biology, with theology. One thing I'd really love for the Institute is to build out the capacity to incubate those really great teaching ideas and ethics and help those go on and live on our campus and frankly, inspire other campuses to have, have deeper ambitions for how they teach students. So one thing we'd really like to build out is the part of the incubator that serves those purposes. Um, and, and Notre Dame, we're the best at this. So we really have a chance to, 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 to be a leader in higher education on that question. Mm -hmm. And then training PhD students. Professors don't come out of a vacuum. And it was totally not an accident that I got to come to campus when I was a graduate student for that conference and got mentored by those Notre Dame professors when I was uh, just getting ready to come on the job market and had the opportunity to pursue a vocation as a college professor. We have to provide those opportunities for really inspired PhD students that are gonna be the next generation of college faculty and higher education leaders. And this is again, something that Notre Dame has the opportunity to really put together innovative, deeply mission focused programs on but we've got to figure out how we're going to support those students as they're studying, how we're going to inspire them and give them the resources to make some like pretty bold investments in their careers. And frankly, how we're going to lead the way for other colleges who are now trying to figure out this question of like, what is higher education going to look like in the next few decades after this? We're, we're in a period of rapid transformation. And this is one where, it, you know, if you've got a strong sense of your vision and values, you have the opportunity to really lead. So those are the kinds of things, you know, NDIS is not going to do all of that. Notre Dame could do all of that. Yeah. And we could be a part of it uh, with our skills at kind of like helping ideas germinate and, and understanding the role of ethics plays. So, so that's kind of the vision. And, and certainly if folks want to support us in that, we would love to build that with y'all. Fantastic. Well, you know, this has been a, a fascinating uh, discussion on so many levels. Uh, let me offer just kind of one final um, opportunity for you to respond here. And, you know, we're in the midst of uh, the second wave of a global pandemic, uh, certainly unprecedented in our lifetimes, and in a lot of across the world, turbulent political times. What, what uh, parting thoughts as a philosopher or what pearls of wisdom uh, would you uh, offer to our viewers? I think one thing that we learn from the Gospels and from our faith uh, is the thought that even if we don't totally understand what like the light is, we believe that it's there. And if we're willing to seek after it with all of our being, with all of our moral fiber, with all of our intellectual capacity, um, God is there to meet us. Like, the, you know, the light's there to find us. And that, that's an important thing to remember when it's like day 100 of the permacloud in South Bend, or we're this far, or in, entering month 11 of the global pandemic, or we're just feeling like there's so much injustice or uncertainty in, um, in institutions that we really care about. You know, uh, we're approaching that as people of faith. We remember that the like, there is a light out there, really actively trying to meet us in our efforts. And so, I guess you know, I was thinking about the inauguration this morning, and and thinking about all the ways that we try to have faith for the long run, not just like not just on Christmas morning, but but mm -hmm. even in the really dark extended periods. And I think one thing that we can do as a Notre Dame community is remember that. As a community of, uh, of people that are united in this institution who are working really hard, and we all know people who are working just incredibly hard and have been since this started, mm -hmm. um, we can make the effort to, to open the space for that light to come in. Mm -hmm. um, like, you know, we, we uh, through our research activities, by being willing to just persistently ask these questions, by, by willing to still have hope that universities, the democratic institutions, the people of goodwill can still um, make a huge difference in the world. And that uh, this is probably a dark time in this century that we're a part of, 
but there's a meaningful, really powerful future that um, that God is a part of that's out there waiting to meet us. Um, and we've got to keep going towards it. So, I, I mean, I'm hopeful in periods like inaugurations or, or just anytime we're going through a transition, we're, we're faced with this deep uncertainty, but part of faith is thinking if, if we know what we're striving for, what we're striving for is gonna come back and meet us. And, and I think that that's true for us as a local community, but hopefully for a country too. Well, thank you so much, Megan. It's been a fascinating conversation. Uh, you're a godsend uh, to oh. students and to the Notre Dame uh, family. And uh, I wanna thank you for corrupting our youth, including uh, uh, my two kids along the way. Um, uh, really, uh, Notre Dame's a better place, ever more tender, strong, and true uh, because you're here. And uh, next week, I want to just uh, let everybody know we'll be joining uh, all of you again at noon Eastern Standard Time, and we're going to be joined by uh, Vice President uh, Mike Seaman. Uh, Mike is the Vice President for Campus Safety and University Operations. So he's going to talk about all the new uh, testing protocols and what we're going to do to get uh, prepared for our students uh, in this upcoming semester. As we always do, uh, let's uh, conclude um, and please join us uh, from your workplace or in your homes uh, with, uh, with a Hail Mary. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Take care. God bless. Thanks again, Megan, and go Irish.